Attention, all troops. He's alive. Alive. Welcome to the Rapnolis. The college that I attended was primarily a science college, so everyone who went there was pretty much a science major with very few exceptions. It was a great place to be because I'm surrounded with lots of like-minded people. At the time I was studying biology and chemistry, biochem, and was very happy about that. And at the same time I was very interested in just about everything but biology and chemistry. I mean here are all these other people learning all these great things and they love to talk about them. So I think I learned so much more from the people around me that freshman year than I did in class. Which means I really wasn't paying enough attention in class. Which I had to work on as time went on. I remember during the spring semester, I had made it through the fall, and I had started hanging out with some people who were really into math and astronomy, and they would have star viewing parties in this big field behind the dorm I lived in. So there was this really warm spring night, I was sitting in the common areas playing Nintendo, when one of these people said, hey, we're going to go and sit outside and look at some of the stars, people had a telescope, it'll be a lot of fun. I thought, oh, that sounds really cool. It was very warm out, people had blankets, I went up to my room and got my blanket, I lay down and people were talking about stars and I was learning all this new stuff. Now I had nothing to say until the subject turned to UFOs. Then I had a ton to say because I could talk about all the movies and TV shows about UFOs that I had seen. And I started talking about Project UFO and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This went on for a couple hours and I laid there learning all about the very dim stars that we could see in central New Jersey and had a great old time. I don't know what time it was, but at some point I nodded off. Now, I'm not one to nod off in public, but I had a habit of not sleeping very much in college at that point. I would just stay up all the time. I think I was having sensory overload and just couldn't sleep. So I conked out on my comfy blanket in the field. Now, I didn't really know any of these people. They all went home and left me when I woke up. And the reason I woke up is that I heard someone walking by me. I looked around and there were people busily going to class. And I was no longer on my blanket. I had rolled into the grass and was soaking wet. I stood up and one of my friends was coming out and saw me and was like, hey, where you been? We've got class. And then he started cracking up. I was like, what's so funny? I knew I was wet and I was really wet. I said, what's up? He goes, look at you. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, you're all red. I ran into the dorm, went into the bathroom, and my face, my arms, everything was covered in bug bites. I had been laying out there all night in the grass and just insects had come and almost devoured me. So what did I learn from that experience? Well, I learned the placement of some constellations, many of which I've already forgotten. And I also learned that it's a good idea not to fall asleep in a field at night. Odds are you're not going to be picked up by a UFO. Instead, if it's a warm night and the moisture is just right, you will wake up covered from head to toe in mosquito bites and your friends will make fun of you for the next month and a half. On today's show, we're going to talk about Project UFO, the way too short-lived Jack Webb's Mark 7 limited production show. We're going to talk about the show's production, its premise. We'll talk a little bit about the stars of the show, the model building that took place in the show, the show's reception, its guest stars, and where you can find Project UFO today. We have an info-packed episode ahead of us, so without further ado, let's start the show. I was going to read the intro to Project UFO, but I think Jack Webb from Dragnet, the guy who produced the show, can do it a whole lot better. Ezekiel 
saw the wheel. This is the wheel he said he saw. These are unidentified flying objects that people say they are seeing now. Are they proof that we are being visited by civilizations from other stars? Or just what are they? The United States Air Force began an investigation of this high strangeness in a search for the truth. What you are about to see is part of that 20-year search. That's the season one intro and the season one theme to Project UFO, and that will change as the show goes on. Project UFO was a television series on NBC, which lasted for two seasons, running from 1978 through 1979, and it was based loosely on the Air Force's Project Blue Book, which was the Air Force looking into UFO phenomenon and deciding if it was real or not. The show was created by Dragnet's Jack Webb, whose production company, Mark 7 Limited, would pour through thousands of Air Force files looking for episode ideas. The show was produced in association with Worldwide Enterprises, which is now CBS Television Distribution. Now, if you have not heard of Project Blue Book, you probably did not watch The X-Files or any other show that dealt with UFO phenomenon. For years, Air Force personnel investigated UFO reports. That information was cataloged and eventually would be released when Congress passed the Freedom of Information Act. That Freedom of Information Act opened up governmental files to private citizens, and TV producer Jack Webb thought, well, science fiction is really hot right now. Let's make a show based on this Project Blue Book, and we'll keep it in a similar fashion to Dragnet, and we'll present it in a very factual way. That's really an interesting challenge, because how do you produce a show about speculation or what people perceive in a factual way? Well, Webb decided to focus on the investigators who, in season one, were played by William Jordan and Caskey Swaim, and in season two by Edward Winter and Caskey Swaim. And we'll talk a little bit about their characters and those actors a little bit later. So we'd concentrate on those investigators and how they did things, specifically how they moved around, what equipment and what material they used, but they would also show the point of view of the people filing the reports. So without judgment, it would seek to look at people's, what they said, what they did, and then would either debunk them or, in certain circumstances, show them to be unsolved. And that was what was very interesting about the show. In the pilot episode, the head of the project at the time, Major Gatlin, tells his newly assigned partner, Harry Fitz, that it's impossible to prove something to be a negative. And since that is the case, it was their job to try to prove that each UFO sighting was real by researching and disproving anything that's a possible alternative explanation. Of course, the head of the project might have had his opinion shaded by the fact that he himself had experience with a unidentified flying object, and we'll talk a little bit about the advisor to the show and how he plays into these characters. And now, this message. Six batteries not included. You can imagine an alien UFO patrolling the edge of space. Suddenly, it reverses. UFO attack. Your phaser fires ahead. The UFO glows bright red and stops. Then the electronic UFO turns, and phaser ready, it begins again. Phaser firing. No time to go. You just got that UFO. UFO attack. An electronic spaceship comes with phaser cannon console from Castle Toy. On Project UFO, teenagers see a flying saucer, and the Air Force must save them from being arrested for a hoax. Something from outer space actually landed in those woods Sunday. This is Tobor. Tobor, the telesonic robot. Batteries not included. He's under your control. With a click from the telesonic commander. To circle. To proceed forward. To circle. 
Or to pick up the support module and return, all on your command. Tobor is robot spelled backwards. Tobor, the telesonic robot from Shopper. When Webb found out that these files were being unleashed upon the world, he obtained microfilm of over 400,000 documents, which covered 13,000 sightings. Plenty of material. Now, a lot of this material was explainable as natural phenomenon, but about 12 to 15 percent are ones that could not be explained, and that doesn't mean that they were UFOs, and there's never conclusive evidence that the UFOs existed in the show, but that means that they just could not be explained through any means besides what the people were telling them. So from the files of Blue Book, in a similar fashion to the from the files of the police department of LAPD, comes Project Blue Book. Just as he had brought police advisors into working on Dragnet and Adam-12, he hired retired Air Force Colonel William Coleman, who headed Project Blue Book in the early 60s. Coleman was interviewed and said that he had had a experience with a UFO early on in his career, which enters into the series, right in the character of Jake Gatlin, who was loosely based, I guess, on Coleman. He tells Harry Fitz that he had a sighting when he was piloting a plane. Coleman said that he and his full crew chased a saucer-shaped flying object over Alabama in 1954. The object seemed to be about 60 feet in diameter and about 10 feet thick, and it did not behave like any craft any of the experienced flyers had ever seen before. Coleman is quoted as saying, what did I see? I don't know. If I had let faith enter the picture, I might have said I was obviously looking at a vehicle from another world, because I knew the technology of what I was looking at didn't exist on this planet, but I don't go that far. It's interesting that the show, which kind of on the front has a sort of dispassionate investigative quality, has an advisor who seems to at least believe that they saw something. And if you watch Project UFO long enough, you see that it actually starts to take on a bit of a, yes, UFOs are real. And they do that by showing very UFO-y type stuff at the end where people find evidence and that stuff isn't picked up by the investigators, but we see it on camera. Of course, this fits right in with the dramatization where Webb is saying this show is about what people perceive. So whatever story these people are telling is what he's telling. It makes for really interesting TV. Confusing at times, but very interesting. So a little bit about the cast. In season one, you had William Jordan playing Major Jake Gatlin. Jordan was born in 1937 in Indiana. He played in the 1957 basketball team that the movie Hoosiers is based on. He would serve in the Air Force and get the rank of first lieutenant. He would work in country music and radio. Then he would work in acting, eventually moving to California in 1972 and staying there until 1999. Kasky Swaim played Staff Sergeant Harry Fitz. Swaim is an interesting story. He was born in North Carolina on January 11, 1949. His character in the show was from South Carolina. He talks about it a lot in the very early episodes of Project UFO. Project UFO was the first television role he ever played. He had no acting training when he moved to Los Angeles and was discovered while working as a bellhop at a hotel on Sunset Boulevard with a small role in March of 77 in the Henry Winkler film Heroes. It was from that that his agent would meet with Jack Webb's people and that he would get this role in Project UFO. So he's virtually unknown at the time. Back in the day when he was interviewed about the role, he was asked if he believed in UFOs and he said that the government set up Project Blue Book because they were receiving so many reports of UFO sightings. The Air Force wanted to find out what these things were and whether they posed any threat to national security. Some they could explain, others they couldn't. Sure, I believe UFOs may exist. I started believing in them after we put a man on the moon. If we can do that, how can we discount the possibility that there are such things as UFOs? I don't believe we can or should. If you're a fan of Friday the 13th, Kasky Swim appeared in Friday the 13th Part 5. Season 1 also had an assistant to Gatling and Fitz. Aldine King played Libby Verdon. Aldine was from Philadelphia and then moved to New York. She would continue to work in TV and movies all the way up until the 80s. Sadly, she only appeared in four episodes of Project UFO, although I thought she was an interesting side character. It was an interesting take on working women in the 70s. It's a shame it didn't continue. In season two, they dropped William Jordan as Major Jake Gatlin and replaced him with Edward Winter, who played Captain Ben Ryan. He is an amazing actor and has appeared in maybe hundreds of roles. He's probably best known as playing Colonel Flagg in M.A.S.H., 